leaning I'm safe and secure from all alarms we're leaning 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 on the everlasting arms oh how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way leaning on the everlasting arms oh how bright the path grows from day to day leaning on the everlasting you know we're leaning leaning i'm safe and secure from all alarms leaning 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 on the Sting arms, what have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting, you know we're leaning, leaning. I'm safe and secure. All alarms we're leaning. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. This is the season for new anointing. This is the season for fresh outpouring. That the sons and daughters of the King of Glory may rise and shine. That the sons and daughters of the King of Glory may rise and shine as we declare this is the day this is the day this is the day that the lord has made i will rejoice i will rejoice i will rejoice and be glad in it this is the day this is the day this is the day that the lord has made in the beginning god created and for his pleasure all creation sings every son and daughter of the king of glory now arise and shine every son and daughter of the king of glory now arise and shine as we declare this is the day this is the day this is the day that the lord has made i will rejoice i will rejoice i will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let your glory fill the earth. 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 As we declare, this is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. And I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. King of glory. fill the earth king of glory fill the earth king of glory fill the earth as we declare this is the day this is the day this is the day that the lord has made and i will rejoice i will rejoice i will rejoice and be glad in it but this is the day this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. And the whole church said, amen, you can be seated. Today, uh, as we're getting ready to... to I want to focus on one word. Today, Steve's going to be continuing from Mark chapter 7. And in verse 25, Mark uses a word 
that to me emphasizes this entire pericope of scripture that is used. This is a Greek word. You're going to learn something today. Uthus is the word that he uses. He says at the beginning of verse 25, but immediately, Uthus, this lady fell to her feet when she saw Jesus. She recognizes the man that could take away the demon out of her daughter, who could take away all the pain and suffering that she personally was going through. She saw this man, and she didn't wait. She didn't hesitate when she found Jesus. Uthus, immediately, she found Jesus, and she fell at his feet. Let us praise God the same exact way today. Let's continue in song. Father, we love you. We Worship and adore you, we will glorify thy name in all the earth, glorify thy name, glorify thy name. Jesus, we love you, we worship and adore, and we will glorify thy name in all the earth. We will glorify thy name. Spirit, we love you, we worship and adore you, and we will glorify thy name in all the earth, glorify thy name. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. Oh, it is well. It is well with my soul. Though Satan should bar, that though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood. For my soul, it is well with my soul. 
It is well, it is well with my soul, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sighed. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend even so it is well with my soul it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul. God, our Heavenly Father, we're so honored to be in your presence this morning. We're so thankful for the loving kindness that you provide for us each and every day. The way you make the sun to shine and the, the rain to fall on those who are just and those who are unjust. God, help us each day to see all those who are in need of you. Help us to see our own need of you and to lean upon you each and every day. God, we ask a special prayer with the Posey family today as they mourn the loss of their, their father and mentor and friend. Just be with them today as, as they remember him and remember his life. God, help us each day to cherish the lives that we have to cherish each other, the friendships and the relationships that we have because you have blessed us so much to understand what a friendship looks like, what a father looks like. God, please be with us this morning as we worship. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us to take a break from our lives, the lives that can be so difficult and, and busy and knowing that Satan is attacking us in every corner and and God, help us to worship you this morning because you provide for us and because you love us. We're so thankful for Jesus and what he means to us, the example that he set for us. God, help us to each day live like him, to reach out to those who are calling for him, reach out to those who are, are searching, and help us to be an answer for that search. God, as we worship you this morning, may we always remember that you love us and you bless us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, let's all start this one fast together. To Canaan's land, I'm on my way where the soul never dies. My darkest night will turn to day where the soul never dies. With no sad farewells, no tear, no dim eyes, where all his love the soul never dies a rose is blooming there for me where the soul never dies and I will spend eternity where the soul never dies with no sad farewells no tear dimmed eyes 
eyes where all his love and the soul never dies a love light beams across the foam where the soul never dies it shines to light the shores of home where the soul never dies with no sad farewells no tear no dim dies where all his love and the soul never dies my life will end in deathless sleep where the soul never dies and everlasting joys i will reap where the soul it never dies no sad farewells no tear dim dies where all his love and the soul never dies and i'm on my way to that fair land where the soul never dies where there will be no parting hand and the soul it never dies no sad farewells no tear dim dies all is love and the soul never dies boundless love unending joy this is my life it's what i know i can believe that he selected me jesus my lord it's you i owe boundless grace because of calvary his life he gave his love our poor and now can live with him eternally jesus my lord it's you i love how deep the father's love for us how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon a cross my sin upon his shoulders ashamed i hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life i know that it is finished i will not boast in anything no guilt no power no wisdom but i will boast in jesus 
Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. I'd like to read from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, starting in verse 31. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was their a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each again, but teach each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this new covenant that you have established with us, that you have now chosen us all through a faith like Abraham's, that we can come to you, be your children, and be forgiven. And Father, as we remember this covenant this morning, as we partake of this bread, which represents the perfect and unblemished body of Christ that was the sacrifice for our sins, we are so grateful, and we pray, Father, that we can truly, in some way, understand the magnitude of what Christ has done for us through his flesh, which we now partake. In his name, amen. Let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, now as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which reminds us of the blood of this new covenant, again, Father, we're so thankful that, that your Son and our Savior Jesus was obedient to the point of death on that cross and gave his blood for us to forgive us, to usher us into this new covenant, and to give us eternal life. And Father, I pray that we remember this great sacrifice as his life poured from his body and flowed to us as we partake of this fruit. And it's through Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's pray. Holy God, we know and believe that you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. We know that all things are in your hands. And Father, I pray that now as we have this opportunity for those of us who's been blessed, uh, we can and will give back to you um, to show you our appreciation for what you've given to us. And and Father, for those maybe who are not uh, experiencing abundance in their life at this time, Father, I pray that we can always remember there's ways to give back to you, to serve, to love, to to help and encourage others. And, and Father, we just pray that our sacrifice that uh, that we're bringing to you here today through these funds will be used by our elders and our shepherds to uh, carry out your work. And this is our prayer in Christ's name.
finer's fire my heart's one desire is to be holy set apart for you lord i choose to be holy set apart for you my master i'm ready to do your will lord i'm ready to do your will let's pass our attendance cards to the outsides of the aisle we're sitting on we'll have our preacher pals come pick those up children's training worship can now be dismissed to faith boulevard at this time let's all stand up together we're going to do one song and then steve's going to come preach to us out of mark chapter 7 Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me and the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name, blessed be your name on a road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering blessed be your name every blessing you pour out I turn back to praise when the darkness closes and Lord still I will say blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your name blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your glorious name you give and take away you give and take away my heart will choose to say lord blessed be your name you give and take away you give and take away my heart will choose to say lord blessed be your name you give every blessing you pour out i turn back to praise when the darkness closes and lord still i will say you give and take away you give and take away my heart will choose to say Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Name. Amen. 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 Before you sit down, welcome somebody here today to the Beltline Church of Christ. <clears throat> all right, all right. Welcome to Beltline. Glad that you are here. 
It's a pleasure to see your smiling faces. We'll have more time to visit between our worship service here and Bible class coming up, and I hope that you'll take advantage of that opportunity. Also, look around, find some faces that you don't know. Meet somebody today. Find someone that maybe is visiting for the first time and welcome them here to Beltline. Let's, uh, let's really pour that on and be a part of, of this encouragement, which is probably the main reason why we come together, is to be edified, encouraged, and lifted up. I certainly hope that we'll do our part to make that a reality for everyone uh, that's here today. We are continuing our series of lessons from the Gospel of Mark. We're in chapter 7, so if you want to be opening your Bibles there, that's where we're going to spend our time together today. I did ask if you got the video to read chapter 7 and 8 to prepare for where we're going today and into the future. I hope that you took me up on that uh, opportunity because there's some important things uh, that are going to be mentioned today in this text. I want to ask this question, though, as we get started. How are we supposed to approach God? How are we supposed to approach God? How do you connect with the God of all creation? Historically, there have been some answers that have been given to us when we ask the question, how do you approach God? Typically, you would get one of two answers. The first answer is what I'm going to call an ancient understanding of how to approach God. And in this ancient understanding, God is someone who needs to be continually appeased. And you appease God by your good behavior, or you appease God by offering sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. That's the ancient understanding of how people approach God. Now, there is a modern understanding that I believe is equally warped, and that is that God is some spiritual force. We'll call this a modern understanding, that God is some spiritual force, kind of like Star Wars, that we can, we can kind of access anytime we want, no questions asked. And what I want to start with today is this idea, I want to look at the story that Mark tells us that shows us that these approaches are not only wrong, but there is an approach to God that might mean something else entirely different. And so I hope to be able to show that with you as we walk through together. This week we're going to start in Mark chapter 7, verse 24. And here's what the text says to us. It says, And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house, and he did not want anyone to know. Yet he could not be hidden. Interesting beginning to this story. It's a mysterious statement, right? Right off the bat, Jesus doesn't want anyone to know that he's there. He doesn't want anyone to know he's in the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. What's going on? What's happening? There are all kinds of options, but it seems to me that Jesus had been spending all of his time ministering in these Jewish provinces and that that ministry was drawing overwhelming crowds. I mean, day after day after day, he has no time for himself, no time to commune with God. And I think Jesus is exhausted. And so he leaves those Jewish provinces and he goes into Gentile territory to try to get some rest, but to no avail. Uh, it doesn't work. And the reason why Jesus can't get any rest is because of this. And this is the first thing I want you to see today. It's simply this. Jesus can't rest because people's needs never take a vacation. Uh, have, have you noticed that about us? Our needs never go on strike. <laughs> Our needs never end. They never stop. Our world is filled with needy people. And sometimes we are those needy people. Sometimes we are the ones who are in need. Jesus says to us later, the, the poor you have with you always, right? There's always going to be another need. There's always going to be another something that needs to be met. We need attention. We need affirmation. We need healing. The list goes on and on and on. The problem, though, isn't the need. All of us have needs. Even Jesus, as he walked the earth, had his own share of needs. The problem isn't the need. The problem is, to quote the old country song, we go looking for love in all the wrong places. The problem is we're too often going to the wrong place to try to get our needs met. We think our needs can be met, like we said last week, in something from the outside in, something on the external. But that's not true. Because as we said last week, the external efforts, anything that we try to do to fix ourselves, to clean up the stain of sin in our own lives, that's never going to work. It's never going to meet the need fully and completely. So we need something different. 
And if we look at our story, we see that this woman arrives and makes her way boldly to Jesus. The question is, how did these people in this region even know about Jesus in the first place? This is quite a haul from where Jesus was doing his ministry. But if you go back to Mark chapter 3, what you find is there were people from the region of Tyre and Sidon who were there when Jesus was doing some miraculous things. And so they take word back about this new miracle worker that is in Jerusalem and Capernaum and in that area, and people are starting to get excited about what's going on. Word is spreading like crazy. And so this woman is in, uh, is in this region and she hears that Jesus is there and she believes that he is the answer for her problem. But there's just one small problem, or maybe we should call it three small problems. She has none of the religious, she has none of the moral, and she has none of the cultural credentials necessary to approach a Jewish rabbi. She had three strikes against her. She's a Gentile, she's a pagan, and she's a woman. And in that society, three strikes, you are out, and she certainly was. She knows that in every possible way, according to the standards of the day, that she is unclean and she is disqualified to approach any devout Jew, let alone a rabbi like Jesus, but she doesn't care. She enters this house without an invitation She enters the house without an invitation, falls down at his feet, and begins begging Jesus to help her. This woman is willing to cross and break down any and every barrier to get to Jesus. And my question to you is, what are you willing to do to get to him? What are you willing to do to get to Jesus? What are you willing to give up to get to Jesus? Are are you willing to risk your reputation to get to Jesus? Are you willing to risk your pocketbook to get to Jesus? Are you willing to risk your very life just to come into his presence? What are you willing to risk to get to Jesus? My prayer is today that like this woman, every single one of us sitting here today, that nothing will stop us in our pursuit of the Christ. My prayer is nothing will stop us. Not unanswered questions. Listen, I know some of you are sitting here today with questions that you don't have answers to and it's driving you crazy and you want to go all in. You want to commit your life to him, but you're just not sure because there's some questions that you don't have answers to. And not just that, some of you are hesitant to go all in with Jesus because you look around and you see a whole bunch of hypocrites in the church and you're right, we're there. We are We don't come together because we believe we're perfect. We come together because we know we're not. And so if you're waiting to commit to Jesus because there's some hypocrites out there, why do you still go to work? Because there's hypocrites there too. Some of you are waiting because you have been exposed to someone else's warped idea of who Jesus is and what he came to do, and you want to go all in, but you're just not quite so sure if this is the right thing to do. And my prayer is that nothing would stop you in your pursuit of Jesus. Not old hurts, not fresh wounds, not broken dreams, not shattered hearts. I pray that nothing will stop you. Because here's a truth I need you to get today. Here's a truth I hope that we can leave. If you take nothing else from the lesson, I want you to take this with you today. You see, when we do all we can to get to Jesus, what we find, and I love this about Jesus, is that he too is breaking down walls and walking past barriers to get to us. If we're willing to go all in for him, what we find is he's already gone all in for us. And if we're willing to risk our reputation to get to him, he's already risked his to get to you. And if you're willing to lay it all aside for him, what you see is he's already laid it all aside for you. I love that about our God. He will go anywhere to meet you. Do you notice where Jesus is? He's in the region of Tyre and Sidon. And if you know your biblical history, you know that this region of Tyre and these are not just guys that don't like Israel. These are bitter enemies of Israel. And what that means is Jesus is willing to go to places where folks don't like him, but who are also most likely hostile to him to get to you and to get the message out of his love for you and his desire to be with you and his desire to have you as part of his family. Next time you're feeling a little depressed, let that sink in. 
There is no stone he will leave unturned. There is no door he won't knock down to get into your life. In Matthew's gospel account of this story, the disciple urges Jesus, send this woman away, get rid of her. But she's pleading with Jesus and she won't take no for an answer. And you want to know why she has this boldness? You do when you think about it. You see, there are cowards in our world, there are regular people in our world, and there are heroes in our world, and then there are parents. (laughs) And parents are not really on the spectrum from cowardice to courage, but because if your child is in jeopardy, you're going to do whatever it takes to get them the help that they need. Nothing is going to stop you from doing whatever you can to help your child. Parents don't think twice, they find a way. And so it's really not all that surprising that this mom is willing to push past all barriers to get her child to Jesus who thinks she thinks can heal her. So we read in verse 25. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the little children be fed first, for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. What is that? I mean, is this Omarosa all over again? I mean, what what is this? Mark uses the word beg to describe what this woman is doing. And the word is used in such a way that indicates that this was continual begging. This is a I won't take no for an answer kind of begging. Nothing and no one is going to stop her from getting her daughter to the help that she needs. I want to show you a picture. When I think of this story, it is this image that I see every single time I read these words. I was in Kathmandu, Nepal back in 2010, and this woman followed me to buy one of her necklaces that she has there. She literally followed me around for an hour. So much so that I was getting aggravated. And I said, listen, if you'll stop following me, I might buy something. But if you keep following me around here, we're going to have problems. I was just so, I was like, I want to see. I mean, I'm in the middle of this beautiful place. This, there's all kinds of stuff going on. There's all kinds of things happening. And I want to engage in everything that's going on around me. And she wants to sell me a necklace. And she chases me everywhere. Everywhere I go, she comes up with another one. She comes up with another. Every time I think of this story, this is the woman that pops into my head. She just would not take no for an answer. But Jesus' words trouble me. What is he saying? On the surface, it appears to be an insult. Right? I mean, he's calling her a dog. Now, understand, we love dogs today, but that wasn't the case then. In Jesus' day, the Jews often called Gentiles dogs because they were considered unclean. So is Jesus insulting this woman? I've always been troubled by the scripture. What is he trying to get at? What is he trying to say? I don't think he's insulting her. That certainly doesn't line up with the character of Jesus. I think this is a parable. And let me try to explain. You see, the key to understanding this is to understand the word Jesus uses for dogs. For us, it would better be translated the word puppy. So remember that this woman is a mom. And Jesus is saying to her, you know how families eat. Parents eat first, then the kids, and afterwards their pets eat too. And Jesus is saying to her, it's not right to violate that order. The puppies must not eat from the table before the children do. 
Now, we know that Matthew gives us a longer version of this story where Jesus says that he was sent first to the lost sheep of Israel. And Jesus goes on to show that Israel is the fulfillment, that he, he wants to show Israel he is the fulfillment of all scripture, of all promise. All the prophets, priests, and kings find their fulfillment in Jesus. And, in, and even the temple itself finds its fulfillment in him. But what's interesting is, right after Jesus is resurrected, he immediately sends his disciples, not just to the Jews, but to everyone, and to all nations. And so his words then are not an insult. He's saying to this mom, please understand, there is an order here. I'm going first to Israel, then the Gentiles later. But listen, I love love it. Listen to what she says next, verse 28. Yes, Lord... Yet even the dogs, even the puppies under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for this statement you may go your way, the demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. In other words, she says to Jesus, yes Lord, but the puppies still get to eat. Yes, there's an order, but the puppies still get to eat, and so I'm here for mine. And and this story is a lot of things, but one thing that we have to see is that Jesus meant what he said earlier in chapter 7 about all things being declared clean, right? There's no longer unclean and clean. Jesus is showing that he was absolutely truthful in that. The old barriers are gone. The old taboos are gone. Those things are being swept away. And the dogs under the table were already sharing the children's bread. And pretty soon, the dogs were going to become children alongside the others. Jesus has told her a parable in which she has given her a combination of a challenge and an offer. And she gets it. She understands. She responds by saying, I know I'm not from Israel. I know I don't worship the God that the Israelites worship. I know I don't have a place at the table. I get that. Listen, she doesn't take offense. She doesn't stand on her rights. She doesn't do that kind of stuff. She says, even though I don't have a place at the table, there is is more than enough on the table for everyone. And I need some. I need some. She is wrestling with Jesus in the most respectful way, but she's not taking no for an answer. And I love this. Now, if this happened in our culture, we would have been offended and demanded our rights. What did you just call me? Right? I mean, we would have been upset at this. We don't know how to contend unless we're standing up for our rights, standing up for our dignity and our goodness and saying, this is what I am owed. And this woman's not doing that. She's not doing that at all. This is, and listen to this, this is rightless assertiveness. I think that's something we would do well to learn about. Because she's not saying, Lord, give me what I deserve on the basis of my goodness. And I've got a typo here in in the slide, so let me just tell you what I'm supposed to be saying to you. Here's what she's saying. She's saying, give me what I don't deserve. I've left out the word don't. That was supposed to be the underline that you fill in. Give me what I don't deserve on the basis of your goodness. This is what she's saying to Jesus. Not give me what I deserve on the basis of my goodness. She's saying give me what I don't deserve on the basis of your goodness. So what is this thing that she wants? What does this woman know she stands in desperate need of? Because if you look at that correctly, not incorrectly, give me what I don't deserve on the basis of your goodness, what is that? It's grace. Getting what we don't deserve, not because of anything that we've done, but simply because God is good and wants us to have it, that's grace, and that's what she stands on. That's what she stands on. And Jesus listens to this, and he's blown away. Literally, he says, such an answer. Such an answer. Some translations would go so far as to say, wonderful answer. 
and her plea is answered, and her daughter is healed. She receives the grace that she needed. This woman understands the purpose of the Messiah better than all of Israel does. Even his disciples who are right there with him. The disciples don't get it. This foreigner, this enemy of Israel does. And I love what Martin Luther said. He said, this woman understood that she was more wicked than she ever believed, but at the same time more loved and accepted than she ever dared to hope. And you are too. You are too. Yeah, you're further down the road of wickedness than you can possibly imagine, but you are more loved than you can possibly dream. There's something huge for us here. You see, there are at least two, probably a whole lot more, but there are two ways that you and I fail to let Jesus be our Savior. And I want to share those two ways with you. Thank you for correcting that. Oh, God, those guys are so good back there. I love it. I love it. Go back up. I want to show that again. Back up one slide. Look at, look at my guys in the back just doing work. Ah, yes, yes. Yeah, they deserve a round of applause for that. That's right. Thank you for making me look not so bad. I appreciate that. All right, two ways we fail to let Jesus be our Savior. Number one, the first way we do it is by being too proud. I don't need God. I don't need this. I can do this on my own. I can handle this myself. So the first way we fail to let Jesus be our Savior is that we're just too proud, so we don't accept his challenge. The challenge to come to him, to be saved, to be healed, to be all of those things. And the second way we fail to let Jesus be our Savior is through this thing that I'm just going to call an inferiority complex where we begin to play the victim and, and we begin to say things like, well, I'm just so awful, God couldn't love me. And really, that's just a smoke screen so that I don't have to change. I, I can keep going down the same path I'm on. God couldn't, that's crazy talk. He loves you more than you can possibly imagine. You see, it's just as much a rejection of the love of God to refuse to seek him, to refuse to come to him, to refuse to come after his mercy, to refuse to accept it, as it is to say, I'm, I'm too good for it, or I'm, I'm not good enough for it. Thomas Cranmer, again, Common Book of Prayers, he wrote this, We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Praise God, his property is to always have mercy. Because if we get what we deserve on Judgment Day, not one of us is going where we want. This woman approaches Jesus boldly under her own initiative. She knew what she wanted and she was determined to get it. And sometimes, that's how we have to approach Jesus. Other times, our approach to Jesus may take a completely different trajectory. Sometimes our first encounter with Jesus feels almost accidental. But either way, Jesus knows us and he gives us what we need. And that's what we're going to see next in this finishing section of chapter 7. Let's read it together. Verse 31. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee and the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him and take him aside from the crowd privately. He put his fingers in his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue and looked up to heaven. He sighed. Underline that word side if you do that in your Bible. And he said to him that Greek word, which means be open, be opened. And his ears were open, his tongue was relieved, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, he has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Now, why does Jesus go through this ritual here in this instance? Jesus does a whole series of things with this deaf, mute man. He he takes him away from the crowd. He puts fingers in his ears. He touches his own tongue. He spits on his hands, puts that spit on the guy's tongue. He looks up. He sighs. He says, be opened. What in the world is Jesus doing? What's going on here? You might say, well, Jesus is doing some incantation. 
He, he's doing the ritual of a miracle worker. Actually, no, that's, that's not it at all. Remember that in every miracle we have witnessed, from the calming of the storm to the bringing of Jairus' daughters back to life, to the healing of this woman's daughter who had a demon possessed, had, was demon-possessed, none of it Jesus has to do any arm-waving or mumbo-jumbo. He doesn't have to do that. He doesn't need to perform this ritual in order to summon his power. And what that means is that Jesus is doing all of this not for his benefit, but for this man's benefit. And what I want you to see is that Jesus deeply identifies with this man. All of the touching of his ears, the touching of his mouth, it's kind of a sign language. It's Jesus saying, let's go over here. Don't be afraid. I'm going to do something about this, and I'm going to do something about that. Now look to God. He comes to a man. He comes into this man's world, and he uses nonverbal speech that this guy can understand. Why does he take him away from the crowd? I mean, if you're a miracle worker, wouldn't you want to do it for everyone to see and be amazed at what you can do? Why does he take him away? I think he takes him away because this guy's been a spectacle his entire life. Jesus is showing him something different. This guy has never been able to produce the proper speech. Just imagine the stares that he got. Imagine the laughs that he got all of his life. And Jesus says, I'm not that guy. I'm going to do something different. And he takes him away. He identifies with this guy emotionally. But there's a deeper identification yet that Jesus makes. Because I ask you to underline or circle that word sigh. Jesus utters a deep sigh here. What is that all about? A better translation would be that Jesus moaned. This is a moan of pain. It's an expression of pain. Why is Jesus in pain? Because he is emotionally connected with this man. He's emotionally connected with his alienation, with his isolation. And you say, well, Steve, that's true, but he's about to heal him. I mean, why isn't Jesus Jesus grinning from ear to ear saying, wait till you see what I'm going to do for you? Because there's an even deeper identification that's going on here. Jesus knows there is a cost that he is going to pay for healing this man. Mark deliberately signals this with the word he chooses to use for the man who is deaf and could hardly talk. The word is mogalalos. That's exactly how you're supposed to pronounce it, by the way. And it's used in only one other place. This is how we know something's up here. This word is used in only one other place. It's Isaiah 35. Go with me. Let's look at it. The one other place that this word is used. It's a rare word. And it's a word that Mark would have no reason to use unless he wanted us to look at what Isaiah had to say in, the exact, in this verse we're about to read. Isaiah 35, we're going to start in verse 4. You'll find the word in verse 5. This is a messianic verse. It's a verse pointing to Israel's Messiah. Listen. Say to those who have anxious hearts, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Now watch. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. And the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy, for waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Mark is saying, Do you see blind people opening their eyes? Do you see the deaf people hearing? Do you see the do you hear the mute tongue shouting for God? And shouting for joy? Mark is trying to get his audience to see that God is 
here. He has come just as Isaiah 35 promised. He has come to save you. Jesus Christ is God come to save you. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But there's something else here. There's something else. Mark wants his readers to think about something else. Isaiah says in verse 4 that the Messiah will come with divine recompense, divine retribution. But, but when we see Jesus, he isn't smiting people. He's not smote anyone. I don't know if smote is the, <laughs> the proper smite. I don't know. I don't know. I don't do English. That's why I'm a preacher. <laughs> Jesus isn't smiting anyone. Jesus isn't taking power, he's giving it away. He's not taking over the world, he's serving it. So where's the divine retribution? And the answer is, and this is the last thing for today, the answer is Jesus didn't come to bring divine retribution. He came to bear it. Jesus didn't come to bring divine retribution. He came to bear it. Now, he will come again, and rest assured, divine retribution will be handed out. But this coming of Jesus was about bearing the penalty of our sin. On the cross, Jesus would identify with us totally. On the cross, the child of God was thrown away, cast away from the table without even a crumb so that those of us who are not children of God could be adopted and brought in. When the fullness of time had come, Galatians 4 says, God made him, or Galatians, when the fullness of time had come, ah, I completely forgot the verse. Don't you hate it when that happens? I got Galatians 4.4 4 and 2 Corinthians 5.21 completely mixed together. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth a son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem us under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. That's what he does. Put it another way, the child has become a dog so that we could become sons and daughters at the table. He identifies with us. And because Jesus identified like that with us, now we know why we can boldly approach the throne of God. And not, not trying to appease, not trying to see some mysticism, but just boldly coming into his presence because Jesus identified with us, we now know why we can approach him. He became mute on the cross. He did not open his mouth so that we and our tongues could be loosed to call him the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Don't be too isolated to think that you're beyond healing. Don't be too proud to accept what the gospel says about your unworthiness. By yourself, you cannot get there. And don't be too despondent to accept what the gospel says about how loved you are. Don't do it. Approach God with boldness and confidence like this woman. Don't take no for an answer. Come into his presence and what you'll find is he's already met you there. And he stands ready to give you what you don't deserve. And that is his grace and his mercy. If you will but come to him, it is a free gift to any and everyone who would trust and obey. And if you need to trust and obey today, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to do that. And I hope that we can help you in that walk and starting your walk and completing your walk and finishing your walk and growing in your walk in any other possible way. And so right now, if we can help you at all, if you need the prayers of this church, if you find yourself in desperate need like this woman, then, then come and let us call on his name on your behalf. If you need to start again your walk with Jesus, come, repenting, confessing, uh, believing that he is the Christ, the son of the living God, and getting into the waters of baptism where he removes our sins and gives us his grace. Come, don't take no for an answer. Pass through the barriers. Pass through the stuff that's been keeping you from him and come to the only one that can do anything about your issues, and that's Jesus Christ. Let's stand and sing together.
Lay your burden down, every care you carry, and come to the table of grace, for there is mercy. Come just as you are, we are all unworthy to enter the presence of God, for he is holy. Lift up your heart, lift up your hands, fall on your knees and pray for the King of kings and the love he brings is here in this place. We raise our voices, raise our song, offer him a praise for the King of kings and the joy he brings is here, he is here in this place. Lay your burden down, every care you carry, and come to the table of grace, for there is mercy. Come just as you are, we are all unworthy to enter the presence of God, for he is holy. Lift up your arms, lift up your hands, fall on your knees and pray for the King of kings and the love he brings is here in this place. We raise our voices, raise our song, offer him a praise for the king of kings and the love he brings is here, he is here for the king of kings and the joy he brings is here, he is here in this place. You can be seated. 